We want to jump right in today because uh, our time, we've got a number of things with the Lord's Supper and don't want to get crunched with that. So let's jump into the Word of God. And uh, let me just remind you, as you open your Bible to the, the book of James, that the chapter divisions in the Bible are not there by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They were added along the way by men, Old Testament and New Testament, so that there, we would be able to reference things and, and, and you know, get everybody to the same part of the Word of God, and that's great. But I tell you that because sometimes we think when we come to a new chapter, which we are doing today, that, okay, turn the page, this is like a whole new situation but I just want to remind us that last week, well, two weeks ago, after you got to go back before resurre Resurrection Day, but the last time we were preaching was at the end of James chapter 1, and the exhortation there was that we would not just be hearers of the Word of God, but that we would be? All right, and, and that is the exhortation, and I hope that you, you've had that in mind, and for me, uh, there's been a couple of practical things I decided to start doing that uh, have been a real blessing just to focus more on doing my faith and not just, you know, being content in it. And so, but that exhortation, remember, it finished up with this uh, challenge, though, the one who thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue. Uh, he talks about that. Then he talks about pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God is what? To visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That idea of helping those that are in the most difficult situations in their day, especially widows and orphans, were the most vulnerable and, and the, most, uh, the most dependent. And the idea was that the challenge to help them, it's very practical. Well, that is, you know, in the air as you move from chapter 1 to chapter 2, because in chapter 2, we're going to deal still with the situation uh, of how the church was uh, treating those who did not have as much as others. So look with me in James chapter 2, and we're going to be reading, starting at verse 1, of course. James says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit murder also said do not commit, I'm sorry, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. All right. A word of prayer. Our God, now we ask that as we dive into your word that you would open it to our hearts. Might we receive the message by your Holy Spirit into each one. For this is your eternal truth, and we come hungry and needing to be fed, needing to be changed, and we know that you use the truth of your word to do that, so we ask you to do it, Jesus, in your name, amen. Well, this is a little bit longer passage, isn't it, than what we've been doing, but there's a, there's a, uh, there, there's a thought that runs all the way through this that... 
We've just got to kind of get the whole thought. And let's jump right in and see the problem that's going on that James is addressing. For there is a problem. Now we begin in verse 1, and he says, my brethren, and he will say, my beloved brethren, and a little later on, you noticed. So he's writing to the believers that he's targeting in this group. But remember, the group that he's targeting is a very broad range group. The, the Jewish people that are spread abroad, dispersed abroad throughout the Roman Empire. And that happened again because of a couple of persecutions. And so he's writing this letter to the whosoever, knowing that he's writing to the church, but also knowing that there will be those that are gathering or around the church that need to hear something a little different. Well, this is a challenge for the church, my brethren. And look what he says. Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when he says do not hold your faith, that word hold also means to have, to possess. He's talking about the faith that you possess, not your believing in this day, but rather the, the, the relationship that you have with, with Christ through faith. Your faith, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great way to think about Jesus, isn't it? You know, he is, that is who he is. We're told in the book of Hebrews that uh, he's the radiance of the glory of the Father, the exact representation of his nature, and he, Jesus, upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, the significance here, and I think it's the reason why James drives to this right away, is do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. When you talk about the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, how does that make you feel? Compared to his glory and his majesty? Do you feel equal to him? Oh, absolutely not. When we talk about his glory, it puts us in perspective. When we think about him in all of his glory and all of his might, the fact that he created all things and not one thing has been created that exists, according to John chapter 1, and we think about the fact that he sustains all things, holds all things together, Colossians chapter 1, we know that our, our, our Lord Jesus is, yes, he is our Savior, but he is the glorious Lord and Savior of our, our Jesus and so, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus. Now, I think the significance here is, when we think about the glory of Jesus, we all realize we're kind of on common ground here, aren't we? Because none of us here deserves to have this wonderful relationship that we have with him. Oh, with this faith that we have in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, James says to his readers, do not hold your faith in that glorious Lord with an attitude of personal favoritism. Personal favoritism. That's a, that, that word, uh, favoritism, personal favoritism, it, it actually comes from a single Greek word. It, 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 it is literally a compound word to, rece to receive the face. To receive someone's face. And apparently, it is a word that only exists in the New Testament. What they're doing is taking a Hebrew uh, statement, a Hebrew uh, way of saying it in the Old Testament, and stating it the same way in the New Testament to, to get this idea across that sometimes people are treated differently because their face, that is, here's the idea of to receive the face, that somebody sees and gives favor because they see something about your face. And uh, think of it like this. We've all been in this situation where maybe you, you're at some event and you're waiting in line with everyone else, and then somebody that is perhaps in charge of the, the event sees you and says, hey, hey, come here, what are you doing here? Hey, come on, I'll, let's get to the front of the line. Come on in, we'll go right on in. And you ever have that happen to you? Yeah, well, every once in a while that happens in life, perhaps, and, and uh, when that happens, what, what took place was they saw your face, and they said, oh, I'm not going to treat you like all the others out there. You get special treatment. Well, that's the idea, and, and, and so this is what is being warned against here, is when it comes to uh, how we treat other believers, we shouldn't be doing it based upon the kind of external things that he's going to talk about here. So uh, the, this, this idea of, again, uh, personal favoritism or partiality, he also uses the same word a little later on. Oh, because here's the thing, guys. There's no partiality with God, according to Romans 2.11. 
uh, when God's talking there about how he's going to be judging whether Greeks or Jews and, and how everybody is guilty under the law. He says, hey, or without the law, they're guilty. But he's saying, hey, uh, there's no partiality. God doesn't look at anybody and say, oh, oh, that one's okay because I recognize his grandfather. Oh, that one's okay because I recognize uh, his income level. That one's okay because I realize the, the, the country that he came from. Whatever it is, God does not show partiality when it comes to his, to his judgment or his work in the lives of people. And that being the case, we have to take that idea of the, of the partiality uh, or, or, or re- personal favoritism and toss that out. Well, here's the problem that there, that's going on. And, and I don't think James is just making this up like, let's just have an armchair theological discussion uh, that's really totally hypothetical. I think James brings this up because this is what's going on. And so verse 2, he says, For if a man comes into your assembly... Now, you remember that the, he's, he is writing in the early first century. This is the first of the letters that we think in the New Testament. And, and one of the things here, remember that the roots of Christianity come from where? From the Jews, yes. I, I just want you to know when he says, for if a man comes into your assembly, literally what he says there, for if a man comes into your synagogue. That's, what, that's the word in Greek, your synagogue. Uh, that's, that, that is synagogue means your gathering place. Now, whether it's the synagogue in a town with the other Jews, this might be the gathering place of the believers, but this is the terminology they're using. Now, the word church will be used in chapter 5, so you know, we, we, uh, we're aware that uh, that, that uh, is another term as well for the believers when they gather. But this is what James says, for if a man comes into your assembly... With a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes. A gold ring in the first century was the symbol amongst the Romans that you were part of the equestrian class, the upper class. They wore a gold ring to indicate that to to people see, I'm an important person. Well, a person comes in with that gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, literally in bright clothes. Bright clothing in that day to get the dye to create bright clothing meant that you had money. Because bright colors, I mean, we say, well, I go to Walmart, I buy whatever I want. They have all kinds of colors. I bought some really tacky orange and yellow shirts at Walmart some years back to be visible when I ride my bicycle. But uh, in in the New Testament time, you didn't say, I'm just going to go buy some bright purple clothes, for instance. No, no. That was very expensive to get the color of purple. And, And so when someone had bright clothing on, again, it's a sign that they have wealth. So one man comes in. A gold ring, bright clothing. And there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes. And this word dirty, by the way, means dirty. <laughs> Filthy clothing. Filthy clothing. Probably the only clothes he had that he owned, so they're dirty. And here's the problem, James says. And you pay special attention, verse 3, to the one who's wearing the fine clothes. Oh, yeah, look at him. And so what do you say to him? You sit here in a good place. Now, in the synagogues of that day, we know from excavations that there were not chairs for everyone in the synagogue. People stood around in the synagogues. That was common, but they, had, they did have chairs. But then they had your most prominent seats up at the very front. It's kind of different today in the church today. The prominent seats are in the very where? Back. Yeah, that's what everybody wants today. I mean, look up here, all these prominent seats that are sitting here. Very few are bold enough to sit there. I don't know why. I don't slobber that much. But, but you know, to, but there's seats that everybody wants. Well, in that day, the, the prominent seat, you know, the, in the synagogue, Jesus talked about that when he was railing against the Pharisees. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Those chief seats. The best seats. So what they're doing is they see this man come into the midst who is obviously very wealthy, and they say, hey, 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 you come here. We want you to sit in the very best seat. Come on to the back row in church. (laughs) (laughs) But then you say to the poor man, yeah, you stand over there or or sit down by my footstool. That's good enough for you. And what's the question or the issue? Here's the question, verse 4. 
Have you not made distinctions among yourselves? Distinctions means uh, this is to, to look through or to sort through. Have you not sorted through people and become judges with evil motives? Again, there, literally, with evil reasonings. You, you, are, you are reasoning and thinking, who do I want to treat one way and who does it really not matter at all? Well, of course... The reason for doing that is because they are looking at the one and, and saying, hey, the guy with the money, he's got money. He's got something I might want to get. He could perhaps build us a new synagogue. He could maybe do something that, with that wealth that we would all benefit from. But the poor guy, what's he got to offer? <laughs> Another person hanging around that needs help. And yet, look at how James addresses this to the church, to the churches. He's going to, he's going to do some reasoning with them, and here he's going to give uh, a question and a statement, and then he's going to give two more questions. The question and the statement that he starts with have to do with the poor man. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. Uh, you've got to think of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the, the poor. Jesus speaks about the, the blessing. But, you know, for each one of us, our calling as Christians, God did not lay hold of you because you were so righteous, talented, Wealthy, famous, lovable, whatever. No, no. Look what Paul says to the Corinthians. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And guys, what Paul just did through the Holy Spirit is he put us as a lump into the category of the foolish things of the world. By the way, don't ever feel bad and don't ever feel like something crazy has happened when the world calls you foolish. When the world calls you foolish, you know that you're doing something right because we're supposed to look foolish to the world. When we look sophisticated and like we have it all together, that's the problem. Well, God's chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God's chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. This is the way that God works. And so James is pointing this out with this question. Listen, this poor man that you're despising, isn't this the kind of person that God has chosen? Now, he doesn't mean by that that all poor people get, get saved. What he's saying is that God loves to take people that are weak and poor and in desperate situations and do great things with them. Yet you're looking at that same person and counting them as worthless. But you have dishonored the poor man. See, that's the statement. He has a question and a statement both about the poor man. You know, the, isn't, isn't this the kind of person that the Lord loves, to, he delights to take hold of? But you've dishonored the poor man. You've cast him aside. Yeah, go stand or, or sit down by my feet. And then he asks two more questions, and these questions are about the rich. Now, again, not every person with money, but he's just saying as a category in that day, look at the questions. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? I did this in green because they have money. Okay, isn't it the rich that take you and personally drag you into court, literally into the courts. And this could be into the court of the Roman uh, era of the city, or it also could be into the religious courts, where because in that day, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they, they had their courts by which people would be judged also for, for breaches of the, uh, of the law and of their commandments. And the, and the whole point is he's saying, you know, when you are dragged into court... Usually, and it's even thing today, when, you, when you're taken to court, it's usually not by somebody that's totally destitute and has almost nothing. Usually, the person that's taking people to court is someone that has wherewithal so that they can hire the largest law firms in America to come and 
go after somebody. There's, you know, that whole mechanism is there. And he says regarding, again, uh, regarding the wealthy, do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? Now, that is not saying everyone does and there are no exceptions. He's just making the general observation that those that feel so well insulated by their wealth feel that often they have no need for God. And they will sometimes be very, very, uh, just, just very uh, <laughs> dour and, and very uh, active in, in their voice, uh, voicing against God and, and the things of God, blaspheming even the fair name by which we've been called. So these are, these are reasons to not do this uh, distinct, this distinct, uh, distinguishing of, of people, this sifting through and, and saying, I'm going to favor this one and cast that one aside. But there's another reason that's brought up as well in verses 8 and 9 that we ought to not show favoritism like this. And, and now we're not just looking at it, these, these questions he asked earlier. Now he goes specifically to Verses 8 and 9, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, let's talk about, let's talk about God's Word and how you're doing keeping it. And, and notice, he's, he, he says to these Jewish believers, if, however, you're fulfilling the royal law. The royal law, that has to stand out in the, in the mind of the readers right away. The, in, the, in, the, in the Roman world of that day, there was a phrase in Latin, the rex legia, and what that meant was the law of the king or the kingly law. The kingly law in that day, in, that's in Latin, everyone in the Roman Empire understood because those were the decrees that were made by the Caesar, the king over the whole empire. This goes back to even before the New Testament times that there was this uh, practice put into place where the, the kings and then the emperors, when they started with emperors, that they could make decrees that became royal law. Well, <laughs> picking up on that same well-known phraseology, James says to his readers, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal or the, it actually comes from the word for king, the kingly law. Now, if the emperor is the king of the Roman Empire and you would do what he says, because after all, he's the emperor, how much more should you and I do for the king who is not just a king, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You're talking about the, this, this one who said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who's the king of kings? Of course, Jesus. Remember, this is what we saw last week or last time uh, the, uh, in, the, in the book of James. That uh, Again, at the end of chapter 1, we cited this, where when Jesus is asked about what the greatest commandment is, he gives that two-part answer, one, to love the Lord your God with everything that you have. And the other is, coming from Leviticus 19, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's exactly what James takes and quotes word for word when he's giving his, his exhortation to his readers. There's a kingly law, not by a human king. This isn't the Roman Empire's king, uh, kingly law. This is the kingly law of the king of kings. And how much more, if he decrees you shall love your neighbor as yourself, well, if you do that, James says, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, again, if you show this receiving the face, treating people differently because you see something external about them, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Convicted by the law as transgressors? That, uh, again, to his readers being convicted by the law, to Jewish background readers, that means a lot. <laughs> Suddenly, what he's doing is he's going to take this showing partiality and underline in, in his readers' minds how serious this is to God when you treat people differently as they were doing. He goes on to verses 10 and 11. And again, he's building this point of, of the severity of this before God. For whoever keeps the whole law, he says, and yet stumbles in one point. Say you have somebody that does everything, but in one place, in one law they break. James says he's become guilty of all. What do you mean by that? 
He goes on to explain, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, both of those are commands from the Old Testament. You find those uh, in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. You find them also reiterated as you go on into Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. So we get these statements about God's heart in these, in these matters. Now, one of the things you've got to say when you see the two, the two examples he uses, do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, would you say that those are lighthearted sins or not very serious, or would you say that those are really serious sins? Those are really serious sins. And, and so right away, you, you see the severity as he's making his point. He's making the point that when, when you, uh, when, when you uh, break one, you become a lawbreaker. You've, you become guilty of all. And, uh, and then he takes these two examples are such serious sins now, here's the thing. He's not trying to take these serious sins and drag them back this way and say, those really aren't so bad. Everything's the same. It doesn't matter. No, what he's doing is just the opposite. He's dragging the sin of favoritism over towards adultery and murder. He's showing the severity of breaking the, the kingly law. Uh, this, again, this is one of the two great commandments that Jesus sums it all down to, to love your neighbor as yourself. You violate that, it's not a small thing, God says. It's a huge thing. And, and to complete the thought, now if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. Now again, somebody could be thinking, now wait a second. So if you, if you, if you keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, you become guilty of all? Well, it's sort of like this is the point he's making. If I take a rock and throw it through the plate glass window over here, you know, I could hit it right in the middle and shatter the whole thing, or I could just bust it out down in the corner or on the side. But once you do it, you got a broken window. Now, I know, I told you my crazy brother uh, who wanted a 22 rifle when he was 10 years old, my parents were smart enough not to get that for him. But a couple of years later, they did get a BB gun with him, a BB gun for him. He shot out the neighbor's door window across the street with it. And we learned that when they came over and my parents had to pay for the window. My parents didn't say, well, it's just a little BB hole right there. That's not hardly noticeable. No, what's the point? The window's broken. James isn't saying that there is no difference in the severity of these sins as far as their consequences. But what he's saying is that no sin is to be treated lightly. There's no such thing as a lighthearted sin. There's no such thing as a, well, what, a, a little white lie. This showing of partiality cuts right against the very important part of what God wants us to do when we treat people. So, speak and so act, both in what we say and in what we do, as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. And now here we are again seeing this same phrase that we saw back in chapter 1. You remember this when he said, uh, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. And I said, it's kind of interesting. That sounds like it's a, a, an oxymoron, you know, the law of liberty. And yet in reality, it is by God's commandments, which he says are not burdensome, that we can live in such a way that we truly do get to enjoy freedom. When we have boundaries, we know where we are within the way we should live, and we know where we're in the place of blessing. When you're outside of those boundaries, or if you don't have boundaries, you never know. I talk about the piano. I have total freedom at the piano. I can pound that thing to my heart's content, but I can't play a song. But someone who has learned the law of how to play the piano can play whatever. This law of liberty is what he says in verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. We live in a very grace-filled place, don't we, in this relationship with God. We get to walk not under all of, the, uh, all of those external requirements of the Old Testament law of Moses, we get to live in the blessing of, yes, there are commands, yes, we know the boundaries, but that's where we live, within those boundaries. 
And what a blessing it is. I had a couple of people talk to me about a study that they saw uh, last time I was preaching in chapter one. They said, you know, there was a study, did you see that, where they took a kids on a playground and put it out in the middle of basically an open field and let the kids play on the playground and said, play, what, do whatever you want. And they've, all of the children stayed right around the playground equipment. But when they took that same playground, or those kids to a playground that had a fence around the perimeter of the, of the, of the land, then the children were out running all over the property because they knew where the boundary was. The, the law of liberty, the idea of having boundaries, it's a beautiful way to live. God's given us laws of, of in, the, in the New Testament, if you would. He's given his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The scripture also says, again, that his commandments are not burdensome. They're a blessing because then we know how we are to live. Well, with all of that, there is a law of liberty by which you and I will be judged. Now, notice this. This law of liberty, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So, this, this comes right from God, from the Holy Spirit. It's the same word, by the way, freedom here is the same word for liberty that James is using. For it was for freedom or liberty that Christ set us free. Therefore... Keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.1, one one of the dangers for us as we uh, start the Christian life and begin to, to experience the liberty that we have in Christ is that we can come back under the law if we listen to the wrong kind of teachers. That's what was happening in, with the Galatian church. You had teachers coming back saying, oh no, you guys got to get back to the law of Moses. There's another problem, though, Galatians 5.13, with the law of liberty. For you were called to freedom, again, same word, liberty, brethren, only do not turn your liberty or freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. The other problem, and we all have seen, where people take liberty and they abuse it. They take freedom and it becomes license. And the Lord says, don't do that. And he gives other places in the scripture where he where he deals with that. The book of Romans has a great section on that. This is, but th- this is the danger, is you can take that freedom and turn it into an opportunity of the flesh. But what God wants us to do is take this liberty, this freedom that we're given in Christ, and serve other people with it. There's the blessing. And then you have that final exhortation. So speak, so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty... And then there's this final exhortation or this observation. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Now, I've read commentators on this that say, oh, he's talking here to unsaved people. No, I think it includes unsaved people. But is it possible for the believer to show no mercy to someone and to suffer consequences in our life? See, there's a kind of, uh, we're not talking about losing our salvation, but listen, uh, if we don't show mercy to people, it has an impact on us. In Matthew 18, there's the parable Jesus tells about these, the, uh, the servant who owes, a tr- in their day, basically a trillion dollars, and it gets totally forgiven by the king. And then he goes and finds someone that owes him a thousand dollars and starts choking them and has them thrown in prison. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. This is Jesus speaking. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, I don't have time to try to unpack, and I don't have the understanding of what all of that is going to (laughs) mean, but I know this. I don't want that to be my experience, do you? That doesn't sound fun. I think I would rather forgive my brother from the heart. We can, if we harden our hearts towards God, we can put ourselves in a place of His discipline, and His discipline can become more severe if we do not respond to Him. That's what's being talked about in Hebrews chapter 12. Read the whole chapter, but here starting at verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. 
Yet to those who've been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet. Now, the, the, the make straight paths for your feet, that is a Hebrew idiom. It means to walk righteously. Don't get distracted and turn off to the right or to the left. Rather, walk straight. Stay on the path. Make straight paths for your feet. Because here's the thing, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. The idea, you read the chapter, is this person has been under the discipline of God. They have a sore limb. Oh, my arm hurts. Well, God's having your arm hurt because you're not walking a straight path. You're, you're, you're not responding to his discipline. If you keep refusing his discipline, he's going to yank that arm out of joint. Now, how much longer do you want to go with that? That's why how much better to turn to him and rather be healed in that sore arm. That's the picture he paints. In other words, there is a consequence when we defy our Heavenly Father of discipline that comes in our lives. Don't put yourself in that place. We go back again to what James is saying. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. <laughs> Praise God. I think I would rather live there. I would rather experience that mercy triumphing over judgment. And by the way, that's exactly what we have received for once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Every one of us in this room that has put our trust into Jesus and been saved, we have experienced and tasted, we've drank deeply of the mercy of God. And if that's the case, that's the way to live. That's why we can say mercy triumphs over judgment, because we've experienced. We've experienced it. So if that is the way that you, that you come into relationship with God and then we're living in this perfect law of liberty, these boundaries that are for our good and we have freedom in Christ with so many things, then wow, why when we're dealing with people should we not show that same mercy? Why do you want to fall into the judgment of God? Well, that's, that comes right to our application and let's talk about that. Because here is, here is, is, is where we've got to go. Uh, so, uh, number one thing of application, this might sound very simplistic, but listen, don't show favoritism. Explanation point. Exclamation point. Now, I thought about this. I thought about trying to word this to, to say a little more fully what I'm trying to say, but I, everything I said filled the screen up. So, I thought I'd better just say don't show favoritism. I've got to realize the severity of when I treat people differently Based upon the face, again, what that means is talking about the exterior, the, the exterior, the external, that something that, okay, here you are meeting someone. Now, James is talking about someone who is wealthy, and certainly there are many times that churches have treated people that come in with lots of money much differently than those who come without it. That's why it was such a fantastic thing that when I was starting in ministry, the elderly pastor pulled me aside and said something to me that has stuck so well. He said, Kevin, never track the giving of what anyone in your church gives, because if you do, you will be tempted to treat people differently. That was absolute gold, because I've abided by that. I have no idea what any one of you here gives. I, I don't go in and check it. That, I, that stay completely out of that realm. We have people that... that follow that, and, and they themselves are not watching like hogs. I mean, but they're facilitating with that, with, uh, with, the, with the giving being properly uh, taken to the bank and applied. But I stay out of that. I don't want to be showing favoritism based upon that, and I don't want our church to be doing that. But listen, it's not just about money. Say, well, what else? Well, there are other things when you talk about receiving the face. By principle, there are a lot of human reasons, a lot of ex exterior or external or just human reasons why we would treat somebody different that would come in the door versus someone else. Let me give you some others, not just money reasons. Fame. What if a celebrity comes in the door of the church? Do people treat a celebrity, a celebrity different? I mean, think about that. Somebody who's well-known comes to church? <laughs> so, Taylor Swift comes to church. 
And just think about that, because Taylor Swift, I don't know if she's a, a believer. I've heard that in her earlier life anyway she professed. I don't know if that's the case or not. I don't follow her, her, her uh, stuff. I hate to tell you, I wouldn't know one of her songs if, I, you know, if it was played. But, um, but that's just because I'm getting older and I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> but here's the thing, what, whatever church she walks into, do the people that day keep worshiping God or do they worship something else? I mean, I know it's crazy wherever she goes, right? Think about that. You know, the greatest gift you could give a celebrity that might walk through the door is to treat them, what, just like any other person. Tony Dungy is here in the area. He attends a church, a very large church, as I understand. But, but what do you think life is like there for people that first walk in and see him and meet him? How many interactions? Wow, I can't believe I get to see. Listen, treat everybody the same. Don't show favoritism. Just because, someone is, just because someone is famous, because they're a professional athlete, because they're a musical artist, maybe they're a Christian artist, maybe your favorite Christian artist comes to church. People treat them differently. Churches treat them differently. It could be fame. It could be influence. Maybe they're a politician. You know, we had years before I came here, a, short, a couple of years before I ever came here as the pastor 23 years ago, we had, uh, we had the, the uh, person, the man who was the tax collector for Pinellas County who attended Suncoast. Yeah, the tax collector. You say, well, boy, I'd like to have a word with him. Well, back in that day, you could have. Uh, but uh, just saying, what, what if you have somebody with political clout? Uh, does that change the way you treat someone? Or with a, uh, maybe they're very uh, involved in, in education, higher education in a university. Maybe they're a, a powerful businessman. Maybe they have great skill of some sort, ability. We treat them differently because, oh, this guy's a very, is, he's a very skilled craftsman. Or, or a, a, this, this lady is extremely creative in, in art, whatever it is. Sometimes it's physical traits that we treat people different. Here's a reason to accept the face. Maybe because someone is very beautiful and someone else is not. And the beautiful person comes in the door and three men walks by. Oh, let me get the door for you here. Come on, I'll show you a seat. And then the person walks through that's not so externally beautiful by the values of our world. Are they treated differently? And the other way, too. What if it's a really, really handsome man? A hunk of a man, you know? <laughs> and then what if there's somebody who's not? Do we treat them differently? Beauty versus ugly, the color of skin. Somebody comes in and they're a color of skin that's different from us. See, very often it's the thing of different. Do we treat people different? We absolutely ought not to. And we'll talk about that. They, the ethnic features uh, about them, where we see that they're of a different ethnicity, their height, their weight. And, and again, sometimes it just comes down to the idea of sameness, that we gravitate towards people that are the same as us, the same culture, the same tribe as we are. They, they speak with the same accent that we do. And, and so... We, we have sort of a, a feeling of, oh, you're good, you're one of us. And someone comes in that's not, is like, oh, you're different. Understand this, Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Every person on the, in the earth, every person that is born, that person is made in the image of God. We are all image bearers, if you would, of God. And that includes the person that is as different from you as can be. Even a person who is lost in sin and living a corrupt lifestyle, still there is an indelible imprint of the image of God in regard to the capacity that they have and what the Lord would want to do in a relationship in their life. No man is an animal. We are created in the image of God. And being in the image of God this is what tells us if all are image bearers of God, then all need to be treated with that dignity. And when someone comes in the door, no matter what their accomplishments, no matter what their beauty, no matter what their bank account, no matter what their, their fame, no matter what anything about them, the thing that levels it all out, first of all, is the fact that they are all made in the image of God. We need to recognize that and not despise the one who doesn't add up in the tabulation of, well, what can I get from this person? We need to see the beauty of the image of God. 
Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, Paul is starting out talking about do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with his evil practices and have put on the new self who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And he goes on to say a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, which was the most uh, abominable barbarian in that day, coming from the, the, the shore of the Black or Caspian Seas. This was the, uh, the, these were the people that were most looked down upon all over the Roman Empire, slave and freeman. There's no distinction in any of that, but Christ is all and in all. And this, again, goes back to the reason why we need to be careful not to show favoritism. By the way, our own pedigree for every one of us before Christ, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And Paul goes on to talk about that in Ephesians chapter 2. Every one of us, when we think that person that comes through, well, you know, but they don't quite match up to me. Where do you think you came from? Oh, I mean, we all, we all climbed out of the slime pit uh, of sin, and by the grace of God have been rescued or saved, but it was God is the one who we made us so that we were no longer enemies of God. Look what he says at the very end. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. There's nothing commendable about us. So when somebody comes through the door and they don't seem to quite match up to what we would say is a proper and prim person, or we think, listen, we've got to say in that instance, look where we came from and what God is doing in our lives certainly God wants to do that there. Here's the goal of all things. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in your love for one another, Paul tells the Thessalonians, and for all people, just as we also do for you. This goes back to the command of love, to love your neighbor as yourself. I love that. To love one another, and here in the church, hey, love one another, we say, but not only that, but to love of all people, because that's the commandment of God. This doesn't mean, by the way, that we still don't have to make distinctions if we are dealing with someone that comes in that turns out to be a wolf, because Acts chapter 20, wolves sometimes come in, and the church is, is directed to deal with that. We know that there are times where you have uh, Alexander the coppersmiths, people that do terrible things to God's people, and they're made note of, such as 2 Timothy 4. We know that there are people that uh, will come into the church that will flaunt immorality. And 1 Corinthians, 5, 1 Corinthians 5 talks about a need to separate there. We know that there are false teachers that will rise up in Titus chapter 1. Titus is told to deal with them. You, 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 we have these kind of things that happen. But note this, when we make those kind of distinctions, it's not because of anything about the person, humanly speaking, or the, the things that they have or have done or their accomplishments. It's because rather of what they're, in those cases, they are doing against the kingdom of God, doing against the truth of God. And in that instance, that's a different thing. They're, but we're not judging them for what they are. In that sense, we, are, we have to discern there and, and, and deal with sometimes the situations because of how someone chooses to act or how they choose to try to influence others. So, that, but this, this don't show favoritism. We have to be very uh, careful with that. Acknowledge your own sins and failures to finish quickly. We, we've got to have a heart like this, that, that, I, that I acknowledge my own sins and failures. See, this again, I, I can imagine the readers of this day being shocked by what James says, the severity of their sin. I think if we all have a, a more tender heart about our own sin and failure, it puts us in a good place as far as dealing with people. Proverbs 28, 13, many times I've cited this with people. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. How do we deal with the sin in our lives? Do we hunker down and say, listen, it's nobody's business? Do we try to conceal it and say it's not a big deal? Or do we confess it? Do we forsake it? Is that where our heart is? 1 John 1, 8, John tells his readers, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. I bring that up because sometimes, you know, that person might uh, show up that is obviously struggling in sin. Now, as a thing, struggling in sin. And, and so 
Don't feel like, well, I'm too clean to help that person. Realize this, that we all are struggling. We are all seeking to, be, to, to walk in victory. And I love Psalm 32, 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, David writes, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I think if we would live in those kind of places and meditate and let that permeate our heart, we'd understand how we need to treat people differently. And we need to go out of our way to show mercy. Go out of your way to show mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Do you want to receive mercy in your walk with God? I finish with this last passage, the need to show mercy to others. Treat others the same way as you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. This is Jesus talking. And then he says, but love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And then this last statement, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And when we meet people and we say, this person is different, this person is not as together as I am, they don't know as much as I know, they don't have as much as I have, uh, they just are going to be, they're going to be a pain in my life. The Lord says, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. I'm so glad that God was merciful in my life, and I'm glad He continues to be. This is the command of God for us today. Not just in the church, by the way, but as you go about your life, as you meet people, as you're in the grocery store or the supermarket, as you're at a restaurant, go out of your way to show love. Go out of your way to be gracious. Go out of your way to show mercy. Go past all of the human boundaries that we get caught up on and rather love people they are in the image of God and they need the gospel if they're lost and they need exhortation and friendship and love if they're saved and they need what you and I have from the body of Christ. So Father, I pray that you would stir us up for you Help us to take your word to heart and help us to become the most loving people, the most gracious and the most merciful people that any of our neighbors and any of our coworkers knows. I pray you would convict us, Lord, as you do that work and guide us, give us your wisdom, Jesus. Amen.